I think that just as we're living in a nuclear age, we have grown so tremendously in scientific knowledge, it doesn't seem uh, too much to say that men can begin to awaken to the fact that they have, haven't grown enough spiritually and haven't recognized their spiritual capacities. Once something like eating is death, then you've struck at the very heart of life. The enemy of the older radical theories may have been the ruling class, but today the stakes of whether we will reform ourselves into a new kind of human being, a new kind of society, whether we will find selves worth being, the stakes of it are simply life itself. Modernity has created promises that it has no ability to keep. What this means is that we're a society of disembedded individuals, um, stuck in the impossible situation of being alone together. And what was understood as emancipation has proved to be a form of isolation. It is important to understand that what I am telling you is not simply a cultural history. It's a description of the story that shapes every single person that you know. This is why there is a rise in mental illness. It's absolutely concurrent with the disembedding of the individual because individuals can't constitute themselves by the very nature of the case. Subjectivity cannot sustain its own weight. We need others to tell us. But we've been given an ethical mandate by the Enlightenment that tells us that that's immoral, that nobody should constrain us. All right, we are back for our second part of recapping the interviews we've done so far for season three. This episode will be looking back on the interviews with Christoy Annopoulos and Dimenshuk. Um, any, any opening thoughts? This is the half of uh, the season or the half of our recap that has to do more with Christianity, right? Like the first part was with Doug Lane. That was our first interview um, where we talk more about, you know, his vision of socialism, what's wrong with capitalism. Um, and his commentary on the society of control, free speech. So if people haven't listened to that, they should go back and listen to it. And by the way, they should also join the Morin Academy on Patreon to support what we do. I wanted to get that in. We will put a link to the notes below. Please help us out. Um, but yeah, like this one, uh, we wanted to put these two together because Chris Doyanopoulos, Alex, Chris Doyanopoulos, um, talked about Dorothy Day and Tolstoy and the Catholic worker movement. And Domenchik talked a lot about um, his experiences with, I guess, intentional community, right? And the importance of Catholic social teaching. So, um, yeah, like we thought those two would go together. Yeah. And I guess for me, the the most important thing from the Christoyanopoulos interview is like, is there, are there two wings of the Catholic worker movement? Um, one more like Catholic and agrarian and uh, trying to integrate like Catholic social teaching into everything. And then the other one um, that I'm calling like the Moronite wing and then a Hennessyite wing that tends to be more secular, more focused on like protesting our way to social justice and a uh, peaceful world. And I feel like he basically gave like a, a no objection, a Nihil Obstat to that theory, um, mm -hmm. uh, like fully endorsing it. He said, yeah, that's happening. Yeah, like that he basically agreed with us that there are these two um tendencies, the one having to do more with protesting and petitioning, right? And that would be what you're calling the Hennessy, right? Because Hennessy was, he came along a bit later after, well, he was called contemporaneous with Day, but like, wasn't he a little bit after the movement started, right? Um, yeah, I mean, he was in radical politics before then. And like, uh, like, I think his story or part of it is that like he saw more and speak and like that kind of brought him into the Catholic work. And so, mm -hmm. and we're talking about Amon Hennessy, not 
Dorothy Day's granddaughters, Kate and Martha, that are still part of the movement. Right. Yeah. They're spelled. Yeah. They're spelled with like S's, and Hennessy's last name is spelled with with a C. Yeah. Yeah. I've I've been confused by that in the past. I knew that, but when I first got introduced to her, um, you know, and her book that she's um just written, I I was confused by that too. Um, but so you're saying that. Hennessy's, Amon Hennessy's um, way of looking at the Catholic worker mission has kind of won the day. Is that correct? Um, if by won the day is being like in the in the majority of like, if, if what won the day means is like his view is more or less hegemonic in the majority of Catholic worker houses. Um, from what I can tell, that seems to be the case. And and I don't think that's only because like ideas have consequences and Hennessy's ideas have more or less won. I think it's also because like one of these, it, it's much harder to maintain a farm. Yeah, I would say um, Hennessy's uh, worldview, which like I said, tends to be uh, more secular or quote unquote spiritual even though you know, like part of his biography is he did convert to Catholicism because of Dorothy Day's influence. And he seems to have let that go for the most part, but um, no. And uh, uh, another, uh, another symbol of this is when he opened his Catholic worker, he named it the Joe Hill house. So it wasn't named after a saint. It was named after the, the union organizer, all of which is, is fine as far as it goes, but it's another example to me of, you know, the more secular labor movement stuff, um, even symbolically, not just practically, but symbolically kind of taking precedence over the Catholic part. Um, and right there, maybe that tensions in the name of the Catholic worker. There's a tendency to em emphasize the Catholic or the worker. Yeah. You know, if people um, Google Catholic worker and they look at the website, you would think that it was a very Catholic movement. I've done that for my book research. And, you know, it really kind of does convey that. So, but you're saying like in practice, and I guess Alex is also saying in practice, the reality is that is not, uh, there's not a resurgence of the Catholic emphasis in the movement. Um. Yes, again, to the extent that I've encountered the movement, which I'm relatively new, um, you know, I've read a fair amount. Um, I try and get around and talk with people. And what is striking is how um, most people are much more like rad liberals um, in their persuasion are, are, are not like if they ran into Peter Moran, they would like not be into it. Because Moran was too much of a devout Catholic and wanted that to be what but I mean, from what I know of Moran, he was so excited about Catholic social teaching and he wanted to bring it here. He wanted the workers and really everybody to know about that. And then he wanted his, the um his idea for the Catholic worker farm or the agronomic university was um re resonated with all that catholic social teaching and with his you know sort of devout catholicism and this has been harder this is the part of the catholic worker movement or vision that's been harder to achieve is not only the linkage with catholicism or, or christianity more generally but also with farming and with supplying people with food. I think what follows from that is no matter what they might say, they've made their pace even theoretically with capitalism. You know, they might say they're against it, but what they really mean is we want Democrats in power um, to enact some progressive social policies that will humanize capitalism. And they'll they'll object to that, but like th they'll say, "Oh no, it's more complicated." Or they'll say, "Look at the work we're doing," and then it's like, "Yeah, but the work you're doing comes nowhere near even beginning to try and like reform society along non-capitalist lines." 
it sort of relies on capitalism continuing, right? It's good work, but it it really relies on it because otherwise there wouldn't be the charitable donations and the donations of food and clothing and things like that that are needed. Those things would have to come from elsewhere. There's there is an abundance of those things in our society. The surplus, the surplus money, and the surplus stuff, and that does seem to be what they main, mainly rely on. Mm-hmm. Right. And they're, and they're fully tethered to it so much so that, I mean, Larry Chap has talked about encountering this and I've fa- found it with the other Catholic worker here and like an adjacent organization that you can't even donate your homegrown food to them because they say, well, we're already getting the expired stuff from the grocery store, so we don't want it. Yeah, I think that's an excellent example. And actually, like I won't name names, but we have a friend um who's actually got this cool idea for starting sort of like a mobile unit. I mean, this is what you told me about to like go out and, um, you know, supply, supply people. It would be a Catholic worker mobile unit that would bring like supplies of food and clothing to people on the streets, which is su- it's such a great idea. Imagine how like f- Catholic worker farms could hook up with that. Um, type of thing to provide the food, you know, and imagine if this person said, no, Spencer, I don't want your food. I can get donations from the grocery store. Just like, I want people to like, kind of, you know, really hear that. (laughs) Because I think that's, you know, like, within that statement is a sort of denial of that the vision of the Catholic worker movement from Morin's perspective is possible. Exactly. And then it's extra for me, it's extra grading when these people are like, Oh, but we're going to go protest as well. It's like, what do you protest? What, you know, what in a, a big thing around here was pushing, I don't know, whatever came of it, but pushing for like McDonald's workers to make $15 an hour. And to some extent, it, it's fine as far as it goes. But there again, you want to talk about like the reduced aperture of um, people's revolutionary horizons. Uh, we don't want to, we don't, I mean, we should, as far as I'm concerned, it's a pro-life issue that we should be like shutting down all of these fast food places. Um, so the idea that it's like a social justice victory and anything but the most short of terms to raise people's incomes by working at McDonald's. Sure. Yeah. I mean, every time people get a raise in the system that we have, prices just um, go up accordingly. So that's a losing proposition. Whereas actually, like, I mean, this is, I think the kernel of the wisdom that Morin had was that if you can supply yourself with even a certain amount of food, either through your own efforts or by cooperating with other people locally using the principle of subsidiarity, you know, doing what you can. That's a Catholic principle, doing what you can at the local, the the small, the lowest level that you can, right? Which Dementia talked about too. Um, you could, you know, remove yourself from the need to have as much money. So, you know, uh, it is good for people to get paid a living wage, but it is like a chase that will never end because every rise of minimum wage increases the cost of things. Yep. And then, you know, where, where a lot of these people, their headspace seems to be is like, yes, of course, we're just going to inflate the economy more, but that's just a step towards somehow or other getting more and more democratic control over the economy. First, we raise the wages, then I guess we'll have to keep raising the wages, and then the people are going to be so empowered that they're going to want to form unions, and then somewhere down the line, these unions have turned into anarcho syndicates or the workers' cooperatives, and I mean, it sounds good, but like, when we're in the 2020s, and we're still trying to, like, unionize, like, national corporate, or, you know, national corporations, and like, it's not going great. Um, yeah, I think it's safe to say that's an old vision that has been superseded by events. That vision 
did not work. It was, and I don't think it, I agree, it's not possible um, to take that route. Unions have been and, destroyed. Yeah, we're, we're a little bit in the weeds, but uh, I guess I'm arguing that, like, the movement as a whole is in the weeds. That um, some vision like that that we're critiquing is far more appealing to most Catholic workers than um, either a kind of Moronite return to the land, uh, neo feudalism, or something like that, um, or an actual like militant Marxist horizon. Both of those visions are anathema, and then you're you're trapped in this kind of capitalist realism seems to me so why do you i mean having listened to both of these guys and just thought about it more why do you think it is so hard for people to think of doing something else other than petitioning the government for limited um increases of benefits or less oppression i'm not fully satisfied with with what i'm about to say like i think it's it's got it it's way more complicated than this but if it's not at the bedrock, it's relatively close to the bedrock of people are like social first and individual second. And therefore, because we live in, you know, uh, a breaking down neoliberal order that, you know, my theory is still holding that we can call it quasi feudalism or quasi feudal capitalism as as we're living in this sort of decaying uh late capitalist society that's our social order so that is what's like over determining everything else we think and this potentially i'm afraid you know i i don't know that you and i have really escaped it uh you know in all sorts of ways the social order is like sneaking into our perceptions of how the world is or should be but um we're we've done a lot of work to try and educate ourselves and figure out what's going on and what we should do. Uh, most people won't or can't do that. And so therefore they're socialized by a crumbling neoliberal order. Well, and I guess I have to point out you, you and um, Emily and other people who are there at the JP two farm are in particular, you know, trying to change your lives in a way that more corresponds to what you actually talk about. And I think that um, people who do that need to get credit. You know, I come and visit the farm once a month and I try to help out. You guys are living there every day and you're trying to do the right thing. So I, and, but you're also right. Like we, it's very difficult, if not impossible to extract yourself completely from a mentality that you that you're raised with and that everything in everything in the economy supports that, right? Everything in our political system supports that way of looking at the world, not the way of kind of human cooperation is what we're talking about here. It's not so much, I mean, you guys farm, but it's not so much even about farming at a certain level, is it? It's, it's about can people strongly cooperate with each other to give each other more social, psychological, spiritual support, and also a certain amount of material support, so they don't have to be quite as um, subjected to the economy and our political system. Is that not basically? Uh, yeah, that's that's what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, but we are in a minority, even of Catholic workers, in uh, looking at it that way. Right. And I, and I mean, obviously, just to be explicit, one of the things this podcast is about is a call for other people in the Catholic worker and beyond to reconsider how they're doing things. They're already doing a lot. Um but we're saying you only have so much time. And at this point in time, the type of things that we're doing at the JP2 farm are actually more of a protest than going to a protest. 
we're getting a bit far from the Christoyanopoulos interview, but I think it does, it does flow out of, you know, the back and forth we had about how effective is nonviolent protests. And I mean, I take his point well, that protest doesn't tend to work uh, much at all. And uh, when it does, it's actually better off being nonviolent. Um, I mean, that, that was a pretty good point he made, I think. Yeah, I agree with that. And he, his arguments seem to be both are important. And when confronted with the reality or the fact that protests these days often are not effective, his answer also was, um, <clears throat> there are many times when it's ineffective. And then every once in a while, when a match is lit in a mass movement, they become very important. And I guess I would agree with that. Like I'm thinking about the mass the mass uprising against communism, for instance, that brought down the Berlin Wall. And that started actually when Pope John Paul, you know, the second visited Poland and, um, you know, the, the, the unions there started to uh, work stoppage. Um, and so uh, it spread from there and it was like wildfire and then getting out in the streets mattered hugely. It changed the entire world. So I think he's right about that. Um, and that was a situation where up until that time, people couldn't protest at all. So if they had been out um, holding placards against the Soviet government, they would have just gotten arrested. Which is partly uh, to, to connect what we were talking about just before to this, is that uh, people will behave in like revel more radical ways when everybody around them is behaving in that way. And so part of, you know, if we do want to build a new world in the shell of the old, part of it is trying to, to figure out um, how not have just I as an individual will behave. It's partly that, but it's also how do we create a context in where, where I mean, more said creating a world where it's easier to be good. Um, how do we create a context where it is easier to be good in like a truly holistic sense? Um, and then, and then how do we, how do we nourish that? Um, and, and to me, that's where, that's why this Morin versus Hennessy debate to me is relevant. It's not about um, one person was better than another or one thinker was better than another but that these people's um, sort of the ideals they embodied have consequences and which ideas we give more or less assent to and how we go about sort of prudentially trying to realize those ideals is very important. And so uh, to me where it's kind of a bummer is like, I don't know why more people aren't talking about like this split and like becoming conscious of like, okay, so what do we do? given these different tendencies, what's right, uh, what would be more most conducive to uh, positively impacting society? Right. And I uh, something we did a while back, oh, yeah, it was our summit that we had with the patron, Patreon supporters where we talked about our agenda. Um, one of the people from the Catholic Worker Movement that attended that said, well, we do have to, that is like a common topic of discussion um, amongst ourselves. So, so they, they are talking amongst themselves about it. I think probably we, and maybe, I don't know, like maybe to a certain extent, the new polity people, there are probably some other, but like we are probably one of the few that are publicly talking about this, um, the choices that we need to make now. I mean, the new polity people are definitely talking at, at least about like principles. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's harder for me to to see what they're like practically doing. Yeah, I think what makes us maybe somewhat unique is that we're providing a a good platform for people to think about these issues, but also we are trying to do it at the same time, and we're learning from the we're learning from the successes and failures of that, much of which falls on you and Emily to deal with. Um, but uh, yeah, like your experiences are coming into um, 
what we're trying to convey to people because it is, I mean, this is like where um, the discussion with Christoyanopoulos and dementia kind of overlap in that both of them raise the issue of like the difficulty of living um, in cooperation with others, how hard it is, particularly in the environment that we're in. Right. Whereas like the society as a whole is still, I guess I kind of view it like being a refrigerator and you're trying to keep your environment colder than the surrounding ambient temperature. Um, It takes a lot of energy just to do that. And yeah, that's where, I mean, to be honest, like I was kind of bummed out by the the subtext of Dimenshik's interview because I kind of view him as like, something like an older brother i guess in the movement because like i i learned a lot from him like his tradice day was like influential in like reaffirming that like okay yeah you've connected a bunch of these dots correctly from like how we should be living our lives to how we should be eating to to our religion all these things should be connected and they should they can be connected with the catholic worker movement um and this all fits together and so he'd like he'd connected all those dots before I had, and then to me the subtext of it was like, well, the the house didn't work out. We're trying to figure out what it is um, that that we do with the rest of our lives, and it's like he has it so figured out intellectually, and but then it seems like there's still this split between. Um, you know, basically it's his Catholic worker, holistic radicalism, the integral liberation that Chap talks about. And then it's like, but so where's the Catholic worker um, action? And, and for at the end of this, for him to be like, yeah, go read New Polity, go listen to Good Money, um, which I, I personally have some reservations about that, pro- that whole New Polity project too to the extent that I've engaged with it. You mean the new money part or the whole thing? Um, somewhat the whole thing, but especially the good money podcast. Mm. Uh, there's something about it to me that is both like too idealistic. Um, and, and, and it's not just that there's, I, I'm going out on the limb because I, I haven't listened to everything. I guess here would be a way a lot of their podcasts to me seem to boil down to if you have a bunch of extra money, here are good things you can do with it. And here are bad things you can do with it. And so then there's a whole debate about like, should you invest in your neighbor's business? Uh, and the answer is yes. Should you invest in the stock ma- stock market? And the answer is no, um, because then you're like participating in speculation and, and usury and things like this. And, and what makes me uncomfortable about it is there's a lot less they'll say they're doing it kind of like catholic workers will tell you they're anti-capitalist these people in their own way will tell you they're anti-capitalist but everything they're talking about presupposes already being successful under capitalism if i'm interpreting them rightly and and i want to be charitable um but to me that's the core of what makes me uncomfortable with them or or put another way they claim that they're post-liberal but i'm not convinced they aren't just like uh a a, a, a refined catholic breed of radical liberal um, or maybe you could say that you know true catholics we're the paleo liberals because we had the uh the orthodox rational core of liberalism before anyone else because we're all individuals made in the image of god um, if we are in a state of grace, then sort of like we are the kingdom marching into the world. And therefore, we can be beyond ideologies because we're just like acting in grace and um, creating that new world in the shell of the old. And then I'm like, OK, I, I think you could like honestly call that a species of radical liberalism. And if your answer is, well, no, because we don't like other radical liberals, it's like, OK, but like all those other species of radical liberals also object to the other species of radical liberals they don't identify with. So I don't know, that's a bit of a rant, but, but what do you have to. Oh, not much other than I, um, I did listen to the good money series 
And uh, I guess the first reaction I had was um, they almost presuppose that people have like the option of having a 401k or something like that. And I do have a 401k, but I know like most of humanity actually does not have that or any retirement savings. So I think that there's a certain feel to it that might be a little bit like, I don't know, like the option for the professional. Um, but I mean, otherwise, I guess I would agree with you that um, they are they are talking about living your life differently to a certain extent by making different choices are they talking about what Sean really wanted and maybe still wants, which is um, actual like intentional, I think he called it intentional community, but like I would call strong community. Did, what's your feeling? Um, I mean, I think they would definitely say they want strong community. Um, yeah, because they want, because in, in their, in their, interpretation of what cst is is you basically have like chains of patriarchal subsidiarity going you know from the family up you know like through the village through the nation into the international level and so um yeah they want strong families and they want those to constitute strong communities um and and would that give you 80 percent of what people join intentional communities for i think so as far as it you know as far as it goes now for me where the rubber hits the road is but we're living under a corroding neoliberal order um how are you going to pull that off and and whatever that looks like success will be hemmed in by more or less uh capitulating to the coming quasi-feudal capitalist conditions it seems to me is their vision of strong community a catholic worker house or is it more like um living in a village and um cooperating with your neighbors it's probably more like that in general okay which is i mean which is more reasonable but i guess that would be a maybe a difference between what Sean at least tried to do with the Holy Family. I think it was called Holy Family um, Catholic Worker House, right? Right. And maybe maybe this is part of what Sean has come to is, is realizing that maybe that strong of community is very, very hard to do. Whereas the type where you live in the same general neighborhood and work together to a certain extent is not so hard to do um yeah although actually i'd argue even that's hard to do sure it's yeah the more you cooperate the harder it is but yeah part of me li listening him to him endorse new polity there was part of me that and again like i want to be charitable to them and i've learned a lot of things from them but something about it rubbed me the wrong way insofar as um i think something's being lost there if, if if and he didn't say this but if if the catholic worker turns out to just have been a phase in his life um my concern is that um something very important to uh what living out cst would look like um is being lost that new polity isn't providing i, I don't know does that does that yeah. sound crazy? no yeah like that's what i was trying to get at with the question about like what's the difference between new polity's vision of like community and what he and you guys uh, us i guess i could say and um other people you know doing this sort of catholic worker house or farm what is the difference between the two and what is lost? I guess I'd like to hear from you. I think like from my Moronite perspective and the Catholic worker, um, it's not so much that something intellectual is would be lost. Um, it's that sort of the drive to 
like in a radical way, positively change society now. Um, and, and try and, um, in a more intimate way, organize with other people to change society now. Yeah, I, I think that's well said. I think that really captures. I've also had the feelings that you're talking about. And I, I, I think they um, mean and intend and have served like a very good purpose educationally. And yet to say that um, they are uh, sort of have, have somehow escaped the liberal mentality or the capitalist system to any degree would would not be true and this is the dilemma to a certain extent we all find ourselves in but i think by pointing that out you know i don't think either one of us um mean anything other than you know we're trying to like figure out how to move beyond that to any degree right and um and to a certain extent you have to you have to move beyond some of this um I guess to a certain extent, I'll call it identitarianism. I don't know how you feel about that term. But of course, in our culture, we have a strong tendency to identitarianism, which to me just means like I'm constantly as an individual seeking my identity and to put on that which will then be expressed to the world and will give my life meaning. But we have like this very deep need. So the difference though is that they do sense that there's there's more like there's much more and it has to do with god it has to do with like our connection to something much more transcendent and that asks so much of us that it's like scary and painful <laughs> and so um this is i think exactly where they're at and why it's worth talking about although to to steal me in their position like if they were here they would say that that is a danger and like they try very hard to be conscious of of that and that they hope they are beyond that sort of thing and that's partly where i'm struggling to talk about it is because they have done so much work to like dot their i's and cross their t's with all this they would say that they're that they aren't doing that most likely right i mean i don't know like um, I, I was just reading an issue where they expressly said that that they reject identitarian stuff like that. Oh, I'll have to read that. Um, what I mean, so you obviously read it. Do you want to talk about that? So this is from issue 3.3, and it was written by Colin Miller, who is arguably like a member of the Moronite wing. <laughs> so the little editorial blurb at the beginning of his article called The Communitarian Alternative, Why New Polity Needs More Church. Um, I'll just read this two-paragraph editorial blurb. Um, the Catholic Church is not merely, as it is often considered, the body of its teaching plus its organizational structure. Rather, it is a concrete way of life, a way of salvation for each of its members. The parish, that body of believers who celebrate the Eucharist together, cannot be understood as a mere part of the church, the lowest part in the hierarchy. Rather, the parish is the place, the only place, where one, with others, is Catholic in the concrete reality of daily life. As such, the parish is the only viable starting point and the ultimate locus of, cath of Catholicism's quote-unquote political aspirations. That is, engaging in Catholic practices within the reality of one's place is the only way to answer the call to sanctify the world, to sanctify it all the way down, even until even the way we do laundry and raise children is Catholic. While the editors and New Polity cannot concur in the pacifism professed in this essay, we endorse the essay's basic claim that being Catholic is not an, a quote-unquote identity or a matter of assent to beliefs extrinsic to the reality of belonging to our particular parish. It is only in concretely living that the correct answers to those otherwise abstract questions of political theology can be discerned and lived out. Okay. I mean, it sounds like they're having a dialogue about this very issue, is what it sounds like to me. 
they're having a dialogue and they're having a discussion, let's say, about this very issue that we're talking about through publishing that piece. Yeah. And I guess maybe it comes back to what I said at the beginning of this podcast about if we're social first and individual second, then how can you be post-liberal or anti-liberal in uh, a liberal modern society? And you know, to some extent, you know, I'm sure if the New Polity people were to listen to this, we would probably rub them the wrong way that they would think we have it 80% correctly. But what's with all this Marxist bullshit and uh, whatever other objections they might have? I suspect their reply would be to question either my like intellectual catechesis and or suspect me of being insufficiently pious because if we all just believe hard enough and if we all are receiving the efficacious grace and the sacraments then that should like always be enough is i suspect what their objection is so at the end of the day i'm just not being faithful enough to which my reply would be this sounds a lot like the pentecostal uh, uh charismatic world that i've i've bumped up against it's that if uh we aren't experiencing the miraculous instantiation of the kingdom of god it's because we're not believing hard enough ultimately that's my best educated guess but you know like you know dementic started out with this with with this idea which he said you know holy family i think lasted a little bit longer than the average um two years that a catholic worker um house lasts so i mean this is what we're i guess what what we're struggling with the most is like that fact and the new polity answer to that is maybe at, at the very least would be maybe a little bit more realism um putting aside let's say the identity that you know like I, I i will just say that whole like the fact that they put that below the what you just read indicates that they are in an ongoing thought process and dialogue about that very issue but like beyond that um the bigger issue is like if if they and we are about, you know, creating stronger community that somewhat exits from the liberal system, how can that best be done so that we don't? It's ridiculous to have Catholic worker houses that last only two years. So to that extent, I know Sean was like, that's good, you know, like, because it's all good. But at the same time, I remember Sean also saying, um, you know, there's this Eden Edenic vision, right? Like, if we had that conversion, you know, of people, and it ended up like transforming the way that they thought, then, you know, what would come next? And he more or less said, well, we have this possibility of creating the Edenic vision, you know, it's, it's utopian, but yet we can come closer to that. Yeah, I mean, to me, that was one of the, I mean, having listened to him for years, that was like the most compelling and new thing um, that I heard him talk about, which is, yeah, just like at, at a level of ideas, you know, how so should society look, you know, from like a Catholic perspective and his answer of like an Edenic futurism is, you know, like one of the things he talked about is like, we would responsibly use things. Um, we don't, but like in a liberal society, we've given up on that because, you know, the responsible use impl implies like a common good that like in liberal theory and in practice, we don't believe in since this is just like a market sublimated war of all against all. There's nothing in common. All that's in common is the war. And, and so therefore um, there's no way to like collectively really limit our consumption other than basically natural limitations. Um, so his example of when oil was discovered, it would be used, um, you know, in this alternative dimension where the fall never happened. Um, when oil was discovered, it would be used responsibly instead of like 
let's just produce as much as we can. And that will be all throttled by the ability of uh, capitalists to make money. And and that's the type of thing where, where I think it is helpful at a theoretical level is it can at least help us to begin to imagine another world than the one we're living in. Yes, absolutely. I um, had a conversation with Clark Massey recently on the Simpleton podcast where we went back and forth about the usefulness of ideal ideals or utopian visions, but I entirely agree with you that um, that is their purpose. We have to be able to talk about them. And it was really refreshing to hear him actually say what he thought we could accomplish if we put our minds to it and what human beings are capable of. Yeah. And I guess part of, again, I don't fully believe this, but I'm in a mood. Uh, I increasingly feel like it's less like um, utopia versus realism. And it's more just like utopia versus dystopia. I was just, it's it's recently been brought to my attention that a few days ago, um, Hillary Clinton published an essay in the Atlantic called The Weaponization of Loneliness. And the tagline was to defend America against those who would exploit our social disconnection. We need to rebuild our communities. And the chutzpah of a Clinton at this late date being like, we need to rebuild our communities is like so gross. I guess if it was, yeah, if I was the type of person that would use the word disgusting, it it is like, I guess, disgusting. That's what people mean. But that's the world we live in. I'll but, just interject that Bill Clinton, I believe, is the father of workfare. Well, well, what do you mean exactly by workfare? Oh, it's the requirement that you need to find a job no matter how low it pays in order to get your welfare benefits. And it ensures that we have a workforce willing to do all the shitty jobs to create all the crap we don't need that keeps our economy going. It's all supported by the requirement that we work. We don't call it workfare anymore. There's some other fancy word for it, but you can't like use your spare time as a poor person to like build up your skills or get an education because you got to work a certain number of hours to get your benefits. Thanks, Bill Clinton. Well, I mean, we have to maintain that reserve army of labor. But yeah, I guess another, I mean, we've been talking about this and it, it's gradually becoming clear to me. You know, we've gotten a certain amount of pushback where at the beginning of that end of the modern world class, I put forward the thesis that um, what Marxists deride as utopian socialism is like basically what Catholic social teaching is calling for, or like it would be a species of that. And I know that sounds impious because like, no, it, it is the thing above everything. And we can't be saying in the same way that people would say uh, the new polity post-liberalism is a species of radical liberalism. People would say you can't call Catholic social teaching like a subspecies of socialism. Like there's something at an intellectual level that I think rubs people the wrong way. But why I think I don't care about that is be- is because I think it's still true that like, okay, I'm sorry, if you believe um, that the common good exists, well, first, let's just start, you believe uh, God became a human and then died and uh, was resurrected. Okay. Is that a realistic, scientific, empirical claim that we rationally believe in, or do we have faith in it? Um, and then further, you know, if we're Catholic, that we believe the Eucharist is uh, transformed into the body and blood of Christ. Uh, do we believe that in, in essences like that? Okay. And then beyond that, so do we believe in the dignity of, of the person? Do we believe in the common good? Do we believe that there's like, a, I mean, this is the, the John Milbank kind of, there's ontologies of peace and ontologies of violence. Do we believe that there's a, the, the starting basis of reality is good. Um, and therefore, practically, to, to me, where every uh, like Republican, uh, Catholic, and, and I guess Christian generally, where they're totally fine to make just a blanket utopian socialist um, statement is they'll say, well, we just should never abort anybody. So there will be at least 60, there would be in the, uh, if Edenic futurism had started in the 60s in America, there would be 60 million or 70 million or however many tens of millions more Americans running around. And 
they'll say, and it would all be fine because we live in uh, a society where we value people and everybody's uh, uh, contribution to society, uh, their labor, whether it's physical or mental, would be like salubrously harnessed for the common good. And then you say, great, can we like do something to stop climate change? And all of a sudden these people, they slam on the brakes and they're like, well, it's all complicated. We can't just be working off of principles here. We've got to face facts. Uh, we have to balance all of these uh, competing uh, interests. So yes, we should take care of the environment, but we have to keep people's jobs open and we have to have GDP constantly expanding. And uh, we've got to juggle all these things and therefore it boils down to we can only do the mo most milk toast of reforms. Right. We literally have to keep all of the things that we ought to change going because it's too scary to pull a thread out and, you know, because that could that could change the entire system. That I think is what Peter Morin was referring to when he said that Catholic social teaching is the dynamite, right? They could blow up. I think he was meaning the existing order, right? Yeah. Right. And people that are like at least it seems to me the normal American Catholic wants that to only apply in the womb. But then somehow or other, the, the fight for human dignity, <laughs> like more or less ends, well, we just, we have to make our peace with late neoliberal society. And let's not lose sleep over how many um, of God's children are wasting their lives in bullshit jobs. Right. And that's, that's huge. I mean, if you believe in personalism and in, in human dignity to waste a life, um, you know, uh, not value it to the extent of consigning a person to a lifetime of low-paid automated drudgery is not exactly the Christian position. And what people will do when they hear somebody say something like that is they'll, they'll say, oh, well, you're a communist or a socialist or you're utopian. It's impossible, like you've been saying. It's impossible for us to change that. We have to work with what is. And then our solution is bundle up a little bit of charity for this person. Give them a grocery bag full of food. Mm -hmm. You know, fix their car, maybe, if they're lucky to have one in a church that does such things. <laughs> fix their car. Hook them up with welfare. So they so drive to their job. Yeah, right, right. That's that is literally not the best we could do. And I think this is what you know, Sean. Um, Sean's commentary was inspiring because it reminds us of what the true Christian vision is, really, and also reminds us of like the potential that we've got now. That capitalism has built up this potential. You know, like the example of oil was a great one. We've got this incredible potential technologically and knowledge and processes that we are just not using to promote the dignity and the well-being of our our people. And it's being used kind of to do the opposite of that. And it's a testament. I, I've tried looking it up. Um, he, he had a line about how he thought it was Pius the Twelfth said, "We're all social modernists," um, and I haven't been able to track down that exact quote. Um, but uh, that—that's part of what we're talking about: is that um, we're just accepting the the political and the economic and the social possibilities of exactly where we are in history, and then we're saying, "Well, that's." You know, we either naturalize it or supernaturalize it. God wanted it to be this way and or it had to be this way. And therefore, we're not free. Whether our, our, our mind frame is like a sort of bourgeois enlightenment, like we're free individuals and we should be able to refashion society. Or if we're these uh, Catholic, radlib, paleolib, whatever we want to call them, um, then we should be able to partner with other people to like create a different kind of world that's like closer to that Edenic futurism. 
Yeah. I mean, there's really nothing uh, in that latter part that is impossible, right? Like literally we have the means, many of us have the means uh, to do that, but we're not doing it. And this is, you know, like this is the gap between, uh, you know, the ideals that you've just expressed so well um, for those who embrace like Catholic teachings, who understand them. And that would be like a small minority of Catholics and Christians because it doesn't get taught, which was something that we discussed with Sean as well. But for those who know and are aware, there's this there's this gap that could be filled. We have the, it's not even utopian to begin to fill that. And still we're not. And so I think, you know, I mean, it sounds, it's painful to hear, but like we all are not doing that all that well. Um, and we should, right? Like it, the the system wouldn't even need to change for us to do a whole lot better um, than we're doing. So that would be step number one, maybe. I don't know. What do you? I, I tend to think it is hard to do this. Why? Why do you think the system could go on relatively easily with minor adjustment? Um. Uh, no. What What I'm saying is not that it's not hard, but we make it hard. In other words, if you really, if you really believed in the principles of Catholic social teaching, and you kept that foremost in mind then we otherwise have the means, many of us do, to do it, right? Um, to at least change the way we live, deal with the people around us differently, form stronger communities, form Catholic worker houses and farms if, if we want to do that, or if we'd want to do it some other way. It's, so, like, it's hard because we make it hard. And obviously, like, again, everything in our environment is in our heads, right? It's, but but basically, I mean, one of the things, and we've talked about this outside of the podcast, I guess when I get like this, I'm basically asking people to be good, <laughs> liberal individuals who are capable of free thought and action. And that's where, <laughs> you know, that might be something that uh, that might be good about liberalism is if we could actually, like, decide to act and behave differently and to not be influenced so much by external conditions. And maybe that's just asking too much. I mean, my experience of the last five years indicates it is. Right. And I'm not arguing it doesn't. I'm just, I'm trying to point out the, uh, the irony of that. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I think it's been adequately expressed on this podcast, how frustrating that is, especially when you're dealing with people who say they believe all those things. Right. But you can't get them to like contribute much, or you can't get them to like show up. And who wants to do the work when it comes right down to it? Yeah. So we we've, we've talked about that, but I mean it's it's important to remind people of those real life frustrations, right? Um, but but I guess all I'm saying is it's not like we're being prevented by some force who's like not yet anyway who's going to come and tackle us to the ground, you know, and stop us from doing this, spending our money in a different way, um, you know, working more with our neighbors, trying to like grow our own food if we have the capability to do that, et cetera. Sure. No, I mean, it's just like, but we just, we get feedback from our wallets and like, it, it, it the sands of time and like our mortality and our energy and our ability to care and have trust that, uh, that doing these types of countercultural things are actually worth it. It's very hard. We're back at that, like refrigerator metaphor. You, you need the power coming in from somewhere to allow you to maintain that disequilibrium. And, uh, it'd be safe to say that, Simply hopes and prayers are not the power that's needed. Wouldn't that be right? I mean, as important as those are, uh, but I mean, I think a lot of times people say their thoughts are with you, but 
That's about it. <laughs> because their mind and certainly their body is elsewhere. Right. So like for people listening at this point, like uh, think about what you can do, I think is a, a lot of what we're boiling down to here. Is there something that you can physically do, right? If you have the capability. And I don't mean like necessarily everybody doing um, physical labor necessarily, but is there some action beyond protesting or talking um, or even just giving money that you can do in your own like personal world um and then do it and see what happens but um maybe i've gotten us too far out of field i don't know i mean it's usually not a good sign when we're asking people to be quasi-functional liberal subjects but maybe that's where we're at uh, but I thought Dominic's interview was great. Like he did a good job of laying out, you know, like a holistic Catholic slash Catholic worker vision of uh, how society should be. Did you want to talk at all about um, the earlier stage of what he referenced, um, which would have to do with, uh, you know, because he, I think he agreed with us that it would be really great. And the church should be teaching um, Catholic social teaching. And or did you want to deal maybe with the idea of the parish as the place where it ought to be lived out? Um, we could we could do both, I guess. What are you? I'm more competent to talk about that second one. I, I think that's a decent place to start. Why don't we talk about that? You know, um, Sean talked about how the parish which is the you know the people in the pews at a particular church um should be learning these social principles and and that it ought to the parish ought to be the locus for cooperation and the start of community um in i mean what do you think of that idea i like it i it's it's far from what I've experienced in parishes so far, yeah. but it, and it's very it's far from what I've experienced too, which I I think is a testament. Even I mean, even if we set aside us tra- talking about like how do we o- reorganize society, even like in terms of learning, like I feel like the model is more or less like when I was converted. Yes, I went to RCIA uh, once a week for you know like a lecture or a talk about something but like that wouldn't have been enough like if i was just a normal person and especially like wasn't raised in a protestant church like i wouldn't have gone to those talks and be been like oh yeah i should just be a christian now like i i was reading all these books listening to podcasts doing all this other work to like ground me like in the wider tradition and like intellectual framework of what catholicism is and so so to me that that's why it's like the common sense is like the church is like church history and like the pope and then we have all these sub churches that are just connected to that one church i think that's how i mean that's how i've always implicitly seen it um even just at a religious level let alone organizing society but is that your experience of it or is that like your mental image of how it ought to be basically both <laughs> yeah because uh because even like what is our i mean it sounds good to be you know so i read that blurb right about the catholic church is not merely as it is often considered the body of its teaching plus its organizational structure rather it is a concrete way of life a way of salvation um uh, the parish, that body of believers who celebrate the Eucharist together, cannot be understood as a mere part of the church. Rather, the parish is the place, the only place, where one with others is Catholic in the concrete reality of daily life. So, I mean, my first response to that is, it is not that. Like, I, not in a concrete sense, right? Like, in my experience, my Catholic community 
daily life happens with you guys and in my neighborhood and with the people that I know. But when I go to church, I go and I get the Eucharist, which is wonderful. But I don't, and maybe this is partly me, but I what there is there does not resemble what I would consider like friendships of mutual aid and intellectual exchange and things like that, right? Like <clears throat> I could go to the, you know, the, the St. Patrick's Day uh, Green Bear Luncheon, right? Um, or Pints with Aquinas, which might not even be going on now, Um uh, or something like that, or a Bible study um, led by led by a deacon. But I don't think that's what we're talking about. And I don't think that's what Sean's talking about. Could it be more? I mean, or is your experience that it is more? That's not my experience. But I think that's part of part of what, you know, whether it's like Catholic workers or, or, or more in or new polity, what everybody's critiquing is this idea that we're individuals living our private lives. And then we go to mass to receive the Eucharist and then it's back to our personal lives. Um, yeah. Right. So, so, I mean, if it could be more, that would be fantastic. And I, I love it if um, the church did, uh encourage that um does it have to be that way i mean it would be nice if it was that way as far as like uh, but could it start something by being that way and to me it, it's i think this is connected with like one of your pet issues is that like pastors need to be teaching cst from the pulpit to me that's the flip side the pastors aren't teaching cst beyond the radical utopian socialist claim that abortion is not load bearing to the American economy. Beyond that, they don't teach much CST. On the other hand, the laity, you know, like you and me included, the laity isn't viewing the parish as their real community, their material and social community, you know, or if they do, in my experience, the people that do view things that way, they mean it like for them, community. It's like a glorified Kiwanis club. So yeah. I would I would argue even there, they're imagining that it's networks of liberal subjects that are friends with each other. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's mainly, um, if anything, social community, and that's not to be sneezed at because that can like start real relationships but it is superficial i mean your example of the kiwanis club is is an excellent one people can be in a kiwanis club and i was in one for years their whole lives okay and they get together and they have fun with each other and they do volunteer stuff and it's a sort of social life but you don't develop deep meaningful relationships by being a member of the kiwanis club and at the end of the day when you die Many people in that club do not even come to your funeral, and no one talks about you anymore. And I know that because I've seen it all the time. Okay, I hate to be but hard. At least if but... they're Catholics, they might come to the mass. <laughs> come to the mass because you got to go to a mass anyway, and then they probably forget about you. <laughs> you know it. I know it. Everybody knows it. Okay. I mean, I'm speaking truth here. I think um, it's scary, but it's true. You want to be with people who will miss you when you die, your life should be meaningful enough that you were remembered. And, or when you get so old that you can't do work for the club or whatever anymore, that they still come and see you. And I've seen repeatedly people, not just Catholics, but Protestants violate that one. As soon as somebody leaves the church and goes to the old folks home, nobody visits what kind of community is that so i've sought my community elsewhere and i guess what was intriguing about like what sean said was could it be different i mean his vision of what it could be is i think precisely ours 
you know, well, what would it take to get there? I mean, teaching CST might be a start, just like having those principles taught and having people and but I think also maybe providing structure to start people on the road to greater like relationships and cooperation with each other. And that's what they don't do. Sorry, I got like emotional because I have I have lived through this with my own elderly parents. I've seen this happen with many old people in this Kiwanis club as well as church. It's ridiculous to give your life to people who won't visit you when you're sick or when you're in an elderly care facility. Don't do it, people. <laughs> and then in its own way, it, it's the, like a validation of the lack of community. That like, why would you join a community where they won't even visit you when you're sick? And therefore, most people don't join or they only half-heartedly join. And then the community suck. So there's this whole vicious circle because of a lack of, you know, caritas. Right. And for some reason, I feel that more like I have discussions with my dad and he's just like, well, that's the way people are. And he sort of laughs it off. Somehow, it's just always struck me as just outrageously unacceptable. And I think more people need to feel that way. You know, like if you believe in these Christian principles, um, but you can't, you can't like listen to a plea for help from your fellow church member um, and, and help them out. With <laughs> the type of um, I mean, I've had the experience of basically telling a minister um, that we needed help and not getting that help after talking to him for an hour. So sometimes it does not work. Um, so you have to ask yourself, like, what is wrong with these Christians, right? That doesn't allow them to like move beyond the sort of superficial. I'm, a, uh, you know, if anything, the church group is a sort of pastime, much like you know, your poker club or something like that at the most. Oh, we need to have Sean back on. Maybe you can help us. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, Spencer. I'm a downer like right now. You got me. I mean, I got on a topic that I feel so deeply about from my own personal experience that I get angry. And that's not necessarily a good way to end a podcast. Well, we could segue to the the quote from that Vatican II document that he ah, said. I can do that. So, yeah, I wanted to read from this because this was what Sean cited as far as like kind of what the relationship between um, the church and the laity should be, the lay apostolate. And it's from uh, a Vatican II document called Apostolicum Actuositatum, which was promulgated by His Holiness Pope Paul VI in 1965. And I'm just going to read a little bit of the part, chapter five, that deals with external relationships, which has to do with this relationship between the church hierarchy, so to speak, and the lay people. Um, so, he says, whether the lay apostolate is exercised by the faithful as individuals or as members of organizations, it should be incorporated into the apostolic apostolate of the whole church according to a right system of relationships. Indeed, union with those whom the Holy Spirit has assigned to rule his church is an essential element of the Christian apostolate, that is the lay people. Uh, no less necessary is cooperation amongst various projects of the apostolate, which must be suitably directed by the hierarchy. Suitably directed is pretty strong language, right? That implies a sort of direct um, relationship of leadership between the church and the laity. Um, and then it says, indeed, the spirit of unity should be promoted in order that fraternal charity may be resplendent in the whole apostolate of the church. Common goals may be attained and destructive rivalries avoided. For this, there is need for mutual esteem among all the forms of the apostolate in the church. And with due respect for the particular character of each organization, proper coordination 
This is most fitting since a particular activity in the church requires harmony and apostolic cooperation on the part of both branches of the clergy, the religious, and the laity. The hierarchy should promote the apostolate of the laity, provide it with spiritual principles and support, direct the conduct of this apostolate to the common good of the church, and attend to the preservation of doctrine and order. So, I'll just stop there. There's quite a bit more, and people should read it for themselves. But to me, this all implies a pretty, like, direct, um, you know, responsibility of the church to support and to form a lay apostolate. I guess I just raised the question. I don't think that we're like blind to all the dope apostolic work happening around us, right? No, right. Especially Catholic. I mean, the Catholic worker movement. Obviously, we're very aware of that. It's not supported. It's not directly like ordered or supported by the church, and that's probably like by mutual. Um, yes. But so this this is one of your axes to grind that you think the church should be uh, sponsoring and materially supporting and assisting with all sorts of lay apostolates to realize CSD. Yeah. And yeah, I went to the website that was created, um, and I'm going to blank out on the name of this, but they created a, um, I think it was called a directory. Uh, anyway, there's an organization at the top that deals with the relationship between the church and the lay apostolate. And they created an actual directory of like um, official international. They only listed the international organizations of the lay apostolate. And it's a fairly long list, but I got the sense from looking at the website that that this was kind of the extent of the church's like direction or interaction with the lay apostolate is sort of like acknowledging that they're and you know helping out these mm-hmm. fairly large organizations. Um, one was Larsh, um, which is about you know it's a Catholic organization that helps um, people with mental handicaps um, and to live independently. Um, and so so, but like. At again, at the parish level, there was no indication even on the website that that this was a part of the mission. So I would say that that website, and I'll try to find it and put it in the notes, was kind of like the physical reality of what happened with this teaching, right? Like that this is the church's attempt to sort of support and acknowledge the lay apostolate. And that it doesn't seem to trickle down to, you know, on the ground like reality, at least in American Catholic churches. And I get this reminds me of your disappointment with like the the Laudato Si action platform. And so far, like it's like attempting to help people, you know, realize Laudato Si principles in their life. But uh, how effective is it really? Right. Your, right. You, you go to that site and it leaves you cold because um, it, it's it's basically an automated interaction in which you are encouraged to fill out a web form and then you get um, something gets spit out of the system based on, you know, what you've put in as far as your organization, its priorities, the area in which you live. And the recommends you get the recommendations you get are automated, basically. Um, uh, I do think that they do think they they do things to encourage, especially young people, at that higher level of of the church, right? By um, you know, like conferences and things like that. Um, but again, like there's no evidence to me at all that any of that trickles down to my life, to um, the parish level. I don't see it. Um, and what I was really hoping for was that they would be able to hook us up with with other people in our area, and in this case, Kansas City, Missouri, 
that um, believed in Laudato Si principles and were trying to act them out so that we could begin to develop networks and of cooperation. That does that is not a part of it, as far as I can tell. And I mean, you get emails from them, and I, I don't think that um, I'm. I'm not being critical of, of the like the church or the Vatican, um, because I, I actually think what's going on here is probably in both cases, this is the best they can do because the actual um, parish level is not interested in these things because the people sitting in the pews are not are resistant to these things, right? So this is their attempt to the Vatican's attempt to leap over the intransigence of the local level and still get the message out there to ordinary people, many of whom are not Catholic. Um, so yes, like it illustrates my frustration, and I just I've asked this question of of people repeatedly, right? I believe I asked it of Sean in my own in my own way, like, uh, you know, what do you think about the church taking like stronger leadership and enforcing its teachings on, you know, like more or less insisting that parish priests teach these things? I don't know. I can't remember what he said about that. I thought, oh, no, I do remember. I mean, he basically agreed with that and he said it wasn't happening. Yeah. So, well, we're all agreed that nothing's happening. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would just encourage people to read this for themselves. Um, this is like official church doctrine. As Catholics, um, we are supposed to accept this and I, act on it. I believe the terms are you're supposed to give it religious submission of intellect and will wow okay believe that's the the theological notes or whatever since it is like a decree from a from an ecumenical council Mm -hmm. so i don't know i think the difference between catholics and other forms of christianity is precisely this um this aspect right is that the church when it teaches in its official capacity like this um is asking for us to faithfully follow it and so this is a challenge for for all of us read it and one of the things the Moran academy wants to do i think is to delve further into catholic social teaching over time we have a couple of things coming up this fall to help people learn more about it 